Today we're going to see one of the miracles with food. That's kind of, that's my kind of miracle. <laughs> Amen. Uh, this is actually one of those unique miracles that's accounted in all four Gospels. Not everything that Jesus did are in every one of the four Gospels. We know they're, they're synoptic Gospels. In other words, that they kind of uh, correlate with each other and where one uh, or two kind of have the same uh, story the, uh, account. Uh, uh, maybe the other two might have another account immediately following that may not be in the other ones. And uh, it's not until Passion Week that we see uh, the synoptic gospels coming together and all four, um, all four accounts really relaying with each other, except for here. This is one of those instances where all four gospel writers find it applicable for our lives. And so, I want to look at Luke chapter 9, but I also want you to kind of to, uh, think about John chapter 6, another one of the of this these accounts, and, and John gives a little bit more of the personal touch, whereas Luke, we know he's much more of the uh, looking at the details of things. John gives a little bit more of the personal aspect. Uh, he, he talks about uh, where the lunch comes from. He actually gives a little bit about what happens during that time and uh, and then also uh, how Jesus replied to some of the things that were uh, that were brought up during that time. But Luke chapter nine, starting in verse 10, I want to look at uh, these verses of scripture and I want to kind of look at some of what Jesus did here. And it's it's interesting because we're still in this this frame of thought about Jesus at the table, Jesus eating with people. And yesterday, I was sitting at the table with my family. We're doing what we had, uh, we told you we've been doing is having strips of paper inside of a bowl and we pull a strip of paper out. And one of the questions that was asked kind of brought up, who would we want to be with a, a biblical character and uh, when, like what point of time? That's kind of where we went. And so I brought up Enoch, of course. Enoch uh, walked with God and then was not. That's Genesis, Genesis chapter 5. I said, I would have loved to just been there, just see what kind of conversation he was having with God all of a sudden. He wasn't. I mean, that's, that would have been like, Jesenia said, well, that would have been like, that would be like the rapture. And then a question that she had was brought up during that whole time and was about dinosaurs. I'm not quite sure how we got into that segue. And she said, well, dinosaurs aren't in the Bible. And I said, yes, they are. And she said, no, they're not. I've read through the Bible. I've never seen anything about dinosaurs. I said, well, they are. And she said, well, prove it to me. So I said, okay, Job chapter 40 and Job chapter 41, behemoth and Leviathan. I read the verses of Scripture to her, and she was like, oh, wide-eyed. You know, that kind of gets me, (laughs) you know, that was our table talk. Yeah, that's table talk, and that's that was just the engagement of conversation that we're having, you know, the things that we're, that we're going through. And, but that was after a long day. We had a long day yesterday. And it, we were a bit tired, and everybody, Jersenia was kind of in a rush. But then she got engaged. And, and the moment she got engaged, her tiredness went away. How many of you have ever been there? You ever been, like, really, really tired? You just, leave me alone. I want to go. I, w- I want to go somewhere. And this is where the disciples were. They were, like, really tired. Because in the preceding verses, what we find is that Jesus had commissioned them to go out and to go into all the surrounding areas, the communities, and to preach. And if they would be accepted into a house, that they would that they could go into the house. And if they were not accepted, that they were to wipe off their feet and go to the next one. That they were just to go out and just evangelize. Now, things were happening. I mean, miraculous things were happening uh, through the hands of the disciples even. So much so that it got word to Herod. And Herod, in just the preceding verse, says, Who is this guy that's coming out and performing these miracles? So the disciples get back together with Jesus. And they're like, oh, we're exhausted. And Jesus I want, if there's anything I want you to understand, Jesus desires you to have some rest. But that rest doesn't always come in the way that you think. So, so Jesus tells his disciples to come follow him. Let's go over to Bethsaida. We're going to go find a place. We're going to go, go rest. Let's go rest. And, and, and as they're walking, listen, read these verses of scripture with me. 
On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them, and he withdrew apart to the town of Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he told them, Go away! I'm tired! It's not what he said, is it? Now, if you and I were Jesus at that moment, we would have responded probably that way. After a full day of ministry, listen, I don't know about you, but when I when somebody comes to me and when we do ministry, there's more than ourselves that is given out. It's more than just a job. You know, you go to a job, you punch the clock, you do your work, you punch the clock, you go home. You know, with ministry, you're carrying people's burdens. You're, 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 you're loving on them. You're, 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 you're feeling the compassion. You're going through these emotions. There's a lot that's involved, in, and they're tired. They're wore out. And, and their response, look at, look at what happens. Jesus is tired as well, and he's trying to get to Bethsaida, and the crowds find out where he's at, and they follow him, and what does he do? He welcomes them. My first point today is the power of welcome. How welcoming are you? There is power in welcoming even when you're feeling like you're on empty. That's not to say that we should always be doing that. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. There is an importance to rest. But when there is a a real need and when things are going on around you, your ability to welcome circumstances will determine the outcome of those circumstances in many times. What does it mean to be a person of welcome? What does it mean to be a church of welcome? We welcome people who are not like us. We welcome people who may be going through hardships in life. What does it mean to be people of welcome? This kind of reminds me, jo- Joanne and I went shopping a few, uh, a couple years ago. We had gone to Big Lots, and Joanne wanted to get a, one of those welcome mats. You know what the welcome mats? It has nice big welcome. You know, some of them have like flowers. Some of them are very inviting. And there was one mat that said, go away. And I said, here's my mat. <laughs> and Joanne said, no, you can't have that mat. <laughs> Instead, we got one that just doesn't say anything. <laughs> but it was very inviting. How many of you feel that way sometimes? You're just tired. You don't want somebody to come to your door, ring the doorbell, take your time. But how welcoming are we truly? So Jesus welcomes them, and he speaks to them of what? Of the kingdom of God. And then he starts to minister to their felt and personal needs. There were some real needs at that moment. You never know that when you are at your when you're at your lowest, when you're at your most tired point, that God may may bring somebody into your life that has a real need. And how are you willing to respond to those situations and circumstances? Will you push them away because of how you feel or are you willing to take a moment? Are you willing to welcome them and minister to their needs. I want to ask you, are you driven by what you have or by who you have? Here, Jesus tells his disciples, now the day began to wear away and the 12 came and said to him, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countrysides to find lodging and to get provisions for we are here in a desolate place. They were looking, the disciples were looking at their circumstance. They were looking where they were at. Many of the uh, commentators, what they write about this place is that it's a, it's a wide open space. It's, um, it's in a, it's kind of like a valley area, uh, large. You can see thousands of people there. It was too far for them to go from one place to another. Every surrounding community near that area was a small, either a farming town or a sheep herding, sheep herding town. And so there was not a lot 
for a crowd substantially as large as this one. And, and it says that there's 5,000, but that's 5,000 men. We can more than probably uh, guess that there were close to 15,000 people. Uh, many commentators say 15,000 men and women and children who were there on that day. And so they're in a desolate place. There's not really much for them. And the disciples are looking. They're driven by what they have. And what they have in front of them is a little boy who has a sack lunch. This is where John chapter 6 comes into play. In his account, John says that Andrew finds a boy with two fish and five loaves. Here he is bringing this and and says, hey, we got something. Can you do anything with this, Jesus? Maybe at least feed us. (laughs) Can we take a little break? Send them away. All we got is this. This this will be okay to hold us over till we get to the next town. The mentality was they don't have anything. And I want to ask you, what mentality do you have when you're going through things? Where is your focus? Is it on what you have or on who has you? Because the reality is that Jesus was there. And Jesus had performed many miracles. But the disciples were looking at their circumstance. And how many times do we do the same thing? How many times do we go through life looking at our checking account and saying, well, we don't have enough? Can I give you a testimony? We took on this project going on tomorrow. We're going to be at downtown at the Malaga Street Station feeding who knows how many firefighters and uh, policemen. So I asked Nathan, Nathan, can you just go out and coordinate, do the project management of this, make sure we have everything and how, and make sure we can set it up correctly. So Nathan goes out there and, and he meets with them. And I had told him, expect, you know, we're, we're going to expect for, uh, you know, between 100 and 200 people just because we know how many uh, city employees there are. So he goes out there and he looks around and he comes back and he says, well, Pastor, I, I wasn't sure what to tell them, but I, I told them that they asked me how many, how many uh, people could we actually feed. And I told them that we could do one to 200, and, and that would be really stretching, stretching us. I wasn't willing to commit more than I could give, right? As those, those were your words. He says, I wasn't willing to commit more than I could give. So I told him we could just do hamburgers and hot dogs for that many. We weren't sure how, what else we could provide. And I said, well, God's going to provide. That day, that next day, I go to the mailbox at the church. And sitting in the mailbox are three checks. There's a check for $500, a check for $700, and another check for $500. This week, we got another check, another $1,000. We weren't expecting, listen, I, I, I wasn't going out fundraising for this. I wasn't asking people for any of this. This is God's provision. Because if we will trust that God will provide, if we will just do what God has called us to do, if we will just reach when God tells us to reach, if we will do what no one else is doing, listen, God will provide. You can't look at what you don't have. Stop looking and saying and limiting God because you say, well, I don't have it. I don't have it. If God instills it inside of you, take the leap of faith and do it. If you do what he's called you to do, you will never lack for anything. The disciples, instead of looking at who they had, they tried to help who they had. How many of us try to help Jesus out? The disciples try to help Jesus out. They sense that the crowd is hungry and they go to him and they say, we are just trying to help you, God. Don't you understand? Look, look at the circumstance. Look what we're faced. Here there is a group of very hungry people. They are starving, Jesus. Send them away. We don't have anything to give them. And many of us try to do the same thing. We can't give up. 
Because if God is in it, if God has spoken it, it will come to pass. He will move on people's hearts. We can trust God. We can believe God for for him to accomplish what he said he would do. Test him in that. And so his disciples are standing there and they're and they're trying to fix it for God. They're trying to give him a solution. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes we try too hard to help Jesus solve the problem rather than just to offer him our faith and our trust. If we will just offer him our faith and our trust, he will do what he will do. So Jesus says to them, you go give them something to eat. (laughs) What? Um, Jesus, I don't know if you understand where we're at here because that's where they go. Look at what they said. He says to them, go, you give them something to eat. And they say, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless you want us to go out and to buy food for all these people, which we don't have enough. In John's gospel, they say, we only have this much amount of money. It's not enough. Can I tell you something? Jesus wants you to be a part of the miracle. Jesus says, you feed them. And they look at what they have. John chapter 6 says that that little boy had that lunch. And Jesus allows them to go through the things that engage their mind. They see, the two, the, they see these, uh, the, these fish and these loaves. And they say, okay, we have this. We have five loaves. We have two fish. Hmm. By our calculations, if we divide this, um, let me see if I if I cut this fish into like micro sized pieces, I can probably get about fifteen people, maybe twenty. Oh, Jesus, it's not enough. Jesus is not enough. I got these five pieces of bread. If I if I we slice it real thin, we can make some bruschetta. You know, some real thin slices, baby. Put it out there, sun-dried tomatoes on top. We can maybe get mm, 25 people. Mm. It ain't going to work, Jesus. It ain't going to work. There's 5,000 men out here. The crowd is hungry. You don't understand. You got. We've got to send them away. Their logic went to what they had, not in what he could do. Once again, there's the problem. But Jesus allows them to see that he is still in control. We must learn to expect the unexpected. I understand we should expect certain things. We've got to frame what the win is as the the new terminology that's out there. Know what what it is, defining the win. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Okay, we, we can frame what the win might be, but we should never limit God in that. Maybe God can do more. And the only thing that's lacking is our faith in his ability to do more. Verse 14, the, the disciples say there's 5,000 men. He says, okay, go make them sit down in groups of 50. Jesus, I think there, you, I, I don't think you heard me correctly. There's 5,000 men. Okay, make them sit down in groups of 50. Um, okay. Hey, Peter, let's go see if we can get this hungry mob to sit down in groups of 50. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, Hey, over here, can you sit down in groups, maybe like 50 in each group? Why? I don't know. Jesus, why? Because I said so. Okay, because Jesus said so. Okay, all right. Ah, Some of them probably left, but there are people who stay. And they sit in groups of 50. They get structured. There, there's Sometimes structure precedes the miracle. Why, why, would, why would he tell them to sit in groups of 50? Well, something miraculous is about to happen. Jesus is about to do some work. And the work is going to provide them baskets full of food that they're going to need to be able to distribute to the people, and they can't do it if everybody's massed together. And sometimes, listen, structure precedes 
the miracle. And I want to tell you that when we have our leaders meeting, when we try to do things and get together and we're, and we're, we're defining what we should be doing and, and structuring some things, God is in that. So, so they structure themselves so that they can then proceed through the crowd and disperse what it is that Jesus is about to do. Sometimes not understanding what Jesus is doing is the hardest thing. How many of us go through that? How many of us have ever been there? Jesus has told us to do something and, and, he, and, and, and it seems like we're kind of just spinning our wheels. We're, we're doing things that we're maybe not comfortable doing. Maybe we're... We're heading up a ministry that we're not really that comfortable in heading up, and yet we're learning in the process of how to develop things, how to grow things, how to grow ourselves, how to plan accordingly, how to make sure everything's lined up. And, and, and there's that time of blooming when you're planted. And it may be a discomfortable time. And, and these disciples were in a discomfortable place. They were tired. They were weary. They were spent. They were done. They wanted the crowds to be gone. And yet Jesus is telling them, keep going. Keep pressing on. Keep moving. Keep doing what you need to do. Listen, you're about to experience something if you won't stop, if you don't give up, if you don't give in. Listen, provision requires patience. Verse 15, and they made them sit down. That was no easy task with 5,000 people. 5,000 hungry people. Then Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and he broke them. And he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. He blessed and he broke them and he gave them to the disciples. Do you notice something here? Jesus gives it to the disciples who are now distributing the broken pieces to the people and they don't run out. Wow is right. You see, because when we're patient in the provision that God is doing, then we, we see the miracle coming through the life that is willing to say, God, use me for this. Use me for this. The other thing I want to think about in that same frame of mind, that little boy is sitting in that crowd. And I want to ask you this. Did he eat the lunch that he brought? Or did he eat the lunch that God made from the lunch that he brought? That'll get you. He ate out of the abundance of God. God gave because he was willing to give it back to God. And that right there, it says it all about our gifts to God, particularly when it comes to our offerings and our giving and what we are willing to give to God. If you're willing to trust God with what he has given, he will multiply it. This is a principle I hope we all get. When you offer what little you have to God, you will feast in a way that you never, ever would have. So then what happens? So they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. I want you to think about this. There were 12 basketfuls that were left over. 12 basketfuls. How many disciples were there? 12 disciples. There, there's, there's this correlation between each of the disciples having a basketful when they're done. Now, how did they enter this whole thing? You remember? Tired, weary, hungry. They were spent. They were done. They had just ministered. And now God gives them a basket full of food. And so they're carrying this basket. And can you imagine the conversation that's taking place? Hey, John, man, I've eaten too much of this bread and fish, man. I've got so much left over. You want some? No, man, my my basket's full. I I don't know. I can't can't eat all this. What do we do? I guess leftovers. Leftovers. And they more than likely carried those baskets for the next day or two, because that's how long the, that food would be good for, a day or two. And, and I'm sure as they're walking down the road, they're handing out people out of the leftovers. God knows exactly how much to give. 
Do you, do you believe that God could have made the exact amount of food at that moment that he would have stopped it as soon as they reached 15,000? That it would have stopped increasing? Absolutely. Absolutely. God knows all things, but he didn't. He allowed them to have, this is a, this is a principle right here. This is a principle we need to get that God Even when we're tired, when we're weary, when we're spent, that God continues to be the source of provision in our life, that He will give us more than we need. Maybe He wanted them to always have something to give instead of running on empty. We live in a society today that everyone's running on empty. Oh my goodness. Sometimes it's just a Something, just a small thing to get somebody just all riled up and upset because their tank is on empty. I was driving from Tampa back here a few months ago and it was late. I had filled up going down there, but coming back, I thought I had enough gas. I use a shortcut through Ocala National Forest and there's a, there's a stretch about 90 miles or so that there's nothing. There's nothing out there. There's trees. Every once in a while, you'll see some beautiful wildlife. And at night, you'll actually see the wildlife come out. And I've been down that road many times. And this particular night, I hit the Ocala National Forest, and my little indicator light on my truck turns red. I'm about 70 miles before I get to the outskirts of Palaka, where the next gas station is i can turn around and go back about 15 miles and catch a gas station or i can press forward i'm not sure what i should do and about five minutes later i was like you know what i'm gonna get i'm gonna keep going i'm just gonna keep going there was a black bear on the side of the road i know there was a black bear i don't know what it looked like i I just knew it was a bear i don't know any of the details of that rest of that 70 miles but i do know one thing my light was red the whole time because I just kept looking at that light. I missed out everything. How many of you have ever been there? Your tank is on empty. You can't focus on anything other than what your tank is at. The problem for many of us is the devil puts up little filling stations called pornography, little filling stations called anger and angst and animosity. Little filling stations called jealousy and backbiting. They give us a little bit of a good feeling. They provide us just a little bit of fuel to get by. And the devil provides this when we're on empty. And I want to ask you today, is your tank on empty? Because the reality of what we just saw, Jesus provided a miracle when his disciples were on empty. And Jesus provided for them an overflow, but they had to keep their eyes on Him. They could not get distracted by everything else that was around them. They couldn't allow the the crowds to sway them. The devil would have taken any opportunity to steal from them. As a matter of fact, if you read the accounts of what took place during that time, Jesus had just had a meal in John chapter 6 with His disciples, uh, and He points out that one of them would betray him. He already knew that that Judas was going to betray him. And at any point in that that whole in time of ministry, Judas could have turned on Jesus at that moment, but he didn't. Listen, we're all constantly being lured by the devil. Every one of us. And unless we recognize that the only filling station is Christ, we will fall prey to what the devil tries to use to entice us. Because there is a good feeling when we let it out on people, when we just blurt it out and get all mad and just, ah. There's a good feeling. We get full. There's a good feeling when we take it out in other forms. But what it does inside of us, it corrupts us and it breaks us and it breaks that relationship that Jesus has with us. Jesus provided the ability for his disciples to understand that he is their provision. He is their filling station with every eye closed and every head bowed. 
my question to you today is, are you running on empty? Or is Jesus your provision today? Have you allowed certain things in your life to provide you the fuel that you need to get by because you're tired, you're weary, you've been spent, you've given everything you have. And now the enemy of your soul is enticing you with little things that bring some self-gratification but will steal the full joy of what God has for you. I don't want you to run on empty. The Lord does not need, does not want you to run on empty. He wants to be your source today. He wants to fill you to your overflow. He wants to give you a basketful so that you can always say, God is my source and my strength. God is my provision. Are you struggling today? Are you lashing out on your family? Are you finding comfort in things that would break God's heart? If so, today is the day to say, God, I lay it down. And listen, I'm not saying that you are sinning. I'm not accusing anyone here today of sinning, but maybe there are things that you find that have brought some relief in your life and you're running on empty. And you're teetering on that line. You haven't sinned. You haven't fallen short. But you know that if you keep running this way, eventually you will fall. If that's you today, you have got to give it to the Lord. Jesus, be my strength. Will you cry out to Him? Lord, be my strength today. Be my provision. May I come to you in those moments when I'm, when I'm overwhelmed by the things around me, when there is so much that needs to take place. There's so much work that needs to happen. I need you. I want to pray with you this week. Is that you? Overwhelmed. Stressed beyond measure. Saying, God, give me relief. Is that you? Maybe there's some of you here today that you have crossed the line. You have sinned. You've allowed something else to be your filling station. And your relationship with the Lord is strained because you've tried to tell Him how to do it. And you've run to things that you should not have run to. To bring your source. And today you're saying, Pastor, that's me. You don't have to raise your hand right now, but will you pray? Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, wash me. Cleanse me. Allow me to come before your presence right now. I ask your forgiveness. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. 